Lord, we, we thank you so much, God, that we have your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much that in him we have life. In him there's, there's newness to life and there's purpose. More, Father, I pray that we would remember that purpose and that, Father, you would instill that conviction of that purpose into our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we engage in the season of missions, Lord God, that we would do it with, with faithfulness, that we would do it, Father God, with continual grace. We would do it with your mercy leading us. And, that, God, that we would go through it with the right mind and the right heart. So, Lord, use the word that's about to be spoken today. May it bring, Father, awakening. May it bring, Father, conviction. May it bring forth truth into the hearts of the sons and daughters of TLC. We thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you are and everything that you've done. We continue to wait for your goodness and your grace. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been going through a, a, going, going through a four-month series on the DNA of TLC. Basically, what's, what, what are we about? Right? If you are a son and daughter of TLC, if you call this place home, what is it about? What is it that we represent? What is it that we would ride and die for? Right? We always say we, we would ride and die. But what is it that we would ride and die for? Our vision, our heart is to make disciples. We want to be disciple makers of this generation. We want to bring people to follow after Christ. But what does that look like? What does a follower of Jesus look like? What does a disciple maker look like? And, we, and it deals with these four areas that we focus on, our DNA. Okay? Past four weeks, we talked about worship. Worship. A disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus is a person who worship, that worship God, who knows who God is, that gives God the worship that he deserves, right? Not careless worship, but a heart of worship, worship in spirit and truth. And these next few weeks, we're going to go into this, this series on missions. See, a follower of Christ is a son and daughter who's on mission, whose life is life of mission. I'm not talking about... Um, necessarily going overseas or to a different country or to some village in some town in some different distant place somewhere, but a life that is continuously moving forward, going out, making disciples. And that's what we're trying to focus on today. Last week, we talked about the call of mission, the call of mission, right? Let me, let me give you a review on that. Actually, open your Bibles, John, John uh, chapter 17. That's where our passage is on. Second to the Great Commission, second to the passage on the Great Commission is this passage. This is one of the classic calls to missions right here. John chapter 17, verse 13 to 19. All right. So your Bibles open up. This is what it says. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Right? Second to the Great Commission, verse 18 is the classic call of missions. Verse 18, it goes... As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. See, we are called into missions. We are called into the Great Commission with equal passion. Whether you are the one going or you're the one staying, you are called to fulfill the Great Commission with equal passion, equal desire, equal intensity. Right? Mission is very simple. It's whether you are, you are the one holding on the rope, jumping into the well, or you're the one holding the rope for the person jumping into the well, right? Mission is very simple. Either you're the one holding the rope as the person is going in, into the darkness, into the place unknown, right, doing the work, or you're the person actually holding the rope and going in there themselves. But you do it either way with equal passion, equal intensity. You do not come at it with this mentality where, oh, so-and-so is going, Right? They're called for missions, or they're called to do this, or they're called to do that. I'm not. I'm here to stay. No. God has called everyone into the mission field. He has called everyone to be part of missions. So the question that we tried to ask last week was kind of something like this. Show me your hands, church. Show me your hands. Where are the scars of missions on your hands? 
See, for your hand will show the great work it takes to risk everything to love in order to disciple someone. Or your hands will show the scars of the one who ensures that the people who go make it back. If you're the one holding on the rope tightly, making sure that they actually come back from that mission, ensuring their safety, ensuring that they are able to go. See, TLC, look at your hands. Are there scars of missions on your hands? Whether you go or whether you stay, are there scars of missions on your hands? See, God didn't call for some to go and then for those guys to be the missionaries. Everyone is called into the mission field with equal intensity, with equal passion. You are called to make disciples. You see, if you're a member of TLC, if you are a signed covenant member of TLC, this is a promise to you. You will make a disciple, right? One way or another, you will make a disciple. We will challenge you. We will rebuke you. We will push you. But you will make a disciple, not because of obligation, but because that is the call of God in your life. You are not blessed so that you can just sit. You are blessed to move forward. You have not been poured into so that you can sit. You have been poured into so that you can carry on the mission forward. You will make a disciple one way or another. Okay? I can't force you guys, if you guys are not a member of TLC, but I can urge you if you are a member, right? So that's what we talked talk about last week. It's the call of missions. You have been called with equal passion. This week, we're talking about the features of missions, the duties of missions, right? What does mission look like? What, is the, what does it entail? Right? And there's the three things that Jesus begins to show us in this passage as, he, as he's praying to the Father for his disciples. He reveals three things. First thing he reveals is the result of missions, okay? He reveals the power of missions, and he reveals the requirement for missions. The result of missions, the power of missions, and the requirement of missions. So Jesus is about to go and face the cross. And before he goes, he sits in the Garden of Gethsemane. He bows his knees and begins to pray for his disciples. And this is the first thing he says. He's, he's been telling them about, he's been, he's been praying to God about the mission that God has given to him. You have sent me here. You have revealed these things to me, right? You have done these things. In verse 13, it says, I am coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy with them. I'm saying these things. What is these things he's saying? It's about the mission. He's, he's giving them this mission. He's praying for them as they engage in this mission. I am saying these things so that they can have joy. The result of missions is joy. Okay? Some of you guys think joy is freedom. Right? Some of us were so inundated with this idea that when I have freedom, then I truly have joy, okay? It's not true. It's not true, right? Freedom doesn't give you joy. It gives you satisfaction for a while, but then it robs you of your joy. Freedom ultimately robs you of your joy. What ultimately gives joy is a life of mission, a life of purpose, a life with a singular pursuit. Because it may not give you a lot of freedom, this life of a singular pursuit, but it will give you joy as a result. Let me give you an example. Let me give you what I mean by this. Okay? So those of you guys who believe that joy comes from freedom, when you first start driving, right? When you were 16, you were so happy to get your car, right? Because why? You were thinking to yourself, I got my car. I can't be held at home. No one can hold me down, right? I have freedom. What did you learn after you got your car? There's a thing called gas, and it costs money right? There's a thing called insurance, and you actually have to pay it, right? So yeah, that freedom and that satisfaction came for a little bit, but that freedom ultimately robbed you of your joy, because every time you drive, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I don't want to drive that far. Gas is expensive, right? Don't you think that? Oh, man, nah, nah. you want me to go where? No, nah, I can't do that, sorry, right? Uh, I got to worry about gas, right? You, you... Freedom doesn't bring joy. Freedom slowly robs you of your joy, Okay? I'll give you an example. You know, um, one of our brothers at church, he loves to surf, right? I gotta get on to do this. He loves to surf, you know? And so when you, when you first start surfing, surfing, I guess, is fun. You know, it, it's fun. You go out, but, you know, getting hit by the waves, crashing into the sand, having sand all over your body. After a while, it gets kind of, oh, all right, it's cool, whatever, right? But 
whenever you talk to him about surfing, he's always like, yeah, I love it. It's like, what do you love about it? It's like, you wake up at four in the morning, I love it. It's freezing cold, I love it, right? I have this huge, I love it, right? It's expensive, I love it. Don't you have to pay for parking? I love it, right? What do you love about it? It's like, oh, man, don't you fall all the time? Yeah, all the time, right? But every time I fall, I learn, right? I have a singular, he has a singular pursuit. I'm going to learn how to surf. I have a mission. I have, I have, I have a direction. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to learn how to get on the board, not fall. I'm going to learn how to turn. I'm going to learn how to read the wave so that I can actually catch the right wave, right? And what do you see from a life like that? Joy. What does it cost him? Sleep. Who wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to the beach? That's crazy, right? Like, he invited me a couple times. I'm like, uh, no. No, not 4 in the morning, right? They tell me, like, they go, he goes at 4 in the morning. Everyone's out on the beach waiting for the sun to rise. He's just out there already. Like, you can't even see him anymore afterwards. He's just out there. He's waiting for the sun to rise, right? Why? Why is there joy? Because there was a singular pursuit of purpose. See, purpose and mission may not give you the full freedom. It may constrain you, but the result of it is joy. There's joy. But when you're in search of freedom all the time, it's all about my pleasure, my will, what happens? Your joy actually gets robbed from you. Right? See, there was a time when we understood this phrase, that there are some things you do because you're a man. Right? You know that phrase? There are some things you got to do just because you're a man. You got to do it. There are things you got to do because you're a woman. There are things you got to do because you're a citizen. There are things you got to do. And people don't like that nowadays. They don't like to be called out of their manliness or their manhood. Right? I said, why, why is Pastor Tony always putting on blast? Right? What's wrong with video games? Why, why do you always got to put us on blast all the time about it? Right? There are certain things that a man does. But we don't like to hear that anymore. You know what people mean, mean when they say that? They mean this. There are, there are certain things, there are causes higher than yourself. There was a time when men, women understood that there are causes higher than themselves. God, family, country. Right? Around 50 to 60 years ago, what ended up happening was this philosophy, we, we started buying into it, where the most important thing in your life is your individual fulfillment. Not the higher cause, but your individual fulfillment. It's all about me. If it makes me happy, if it's good for me, then I'm all right. But if it's not good for me, if it does not make me happy, then it's over. Right? We start thinking about our personal freedom rather than a personal cause, our mission, and we think that that's going to give us joy and beauty in life. What does that, what does that, what does that bring? Okay? You know what the result of 50, 60 years of a life, of philosophy that teaches us it's all about your personal freedom. If it makes you happy, do it. If it doesn't, don't. You know what happens? We have people who make wedding vows, promises, promises that are meant to be forever. We have people making wedding vows and breaking them because why? It no longer fulfills their pleasure. It's not working anymore for me. It's not good for me anymore. See, if I'm not happy, then I can leave this marriage. If I'm not happy, I can leave this relationship. Because it's all about my personal happiness. We're not thinking about the actual cause and mission. And when we start start to live like that, do you actually feel like you're actually being happy? No. Your joy is being stripped from you. Chasing one thing after another. Chasing one freedom after another freedom after another freedom. Hoping, wishing, praying that it will bring you joy realizing it gives you satisfaction for a moment, and that moment disappears. Right? When you're in high school, you say what? I want to get out of high school, get into college. Right? I can't wait till I get into college. I'll get freedom. When you're in college, you're thinking to yourself, I cannot wait till I get a job and start working and move out of my house. You get out of college, you move out into your house, get your job, and what happens? I cannot wait until I get a better job. Right? When you get a better job, you realize you don't end up liking it. So maybe if I get married or have a relationship, I'll get out there'll be something better than that. You have a relationship, you have, you have your marriage, and you realize maybe this is not making me feel good. What if I have kids? Maybe that will give me some pleasure. You have kids, and then you wonder to yourself, man, I don't even like my kids, right? What are we going to do, right? right? See, it's this pursuit of freedom that begins to rob you of joy. It's when you pursue a mission, a purpose in life, that gives joy. Some of you guys said, no, I've never bought into that, Pastor Tony. I'm, I'm my own person. No, you bought into it. Let me tell you how. Have you ever watched Disney movies? Right? You bought into it, right? 
We've been taught, in this, except for the last one. Frozen is actually pretty good, okay? Everyone, every single one besides Frozen have been taught that you should look for your fairy tale ending, right? To ride off in the sunset in the carriage with your Prince Charming and your princess. We're looking for our fairy tale ending. And what happens when you don't find your fairy tale ending? You bone out. You leave. You walk out of that relationship. Ask anyone who's been married a long time. Ask anyone who's been married a long time who's, whose relationship is full of joy, right? They'll tell you that joy in marriage is not contingent. Joy in marriage is not contingent upon your freedom, right? But on the mission of how deep both of you guys go. See, the joy in your marriage is not whether she's satisfying me or he's satisfying me. If they're not doing it, we'll break up. The joy in marriage comes when both of you guys have a singular mission together, moving together towards that mission that God has given to you. And what you see from a marriage like that is that these two people begin to become one. They meld together one mind, one heart, one soul, right? And you see from their relationship joy. You see joy in the things that they do. But in a relationship when it's all about me or all about her, what do you guys do, right? You build up like points for yourself, you know? The guy's like, oh yeah, I got 20,000 points this week, right? And then she just takes it away from you the next day, like, no, no more points. You do something stupid, take all the points away from you. Like, you, you always try to figure out ways to like, oh, I'll let you do that if I can do this, right? Or uh, go ahead and do that. But next time when I do this, right, you should say yes. You, know, you, you build that kind of kind of like um, balance beam with each other. See, joy, right, joy in any type of relationship, okay, comes when two people have a singular mission, have a singular purpose, right? See, do you understand if there's no higher cause than your personal happiness, then there's nothing to deny your happiness for, right? If there's, if there's if in your mind there's no higher cause than your personal happiness, then there's nothing to deny your happiness for. When there's nothing for you to die for, to live for, then the result is you're living in a world making no difference. The result of missions. You know why Jesus prayed for people to be on missions? You know why God gives us a purpose and a mission? It's not so that we can like be tired and be so drained. He gives it because he knows it brings joy. It brings joy. That's what he says. He says, I say these things while I'm still in the world. I say all these things, giving them this mission so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I was given the mission, Jesus says, from you. I was given this mission from you to go into this place, to die for these sons and daughters of mine who do not even care for me, but that's my mission. And as I live out that mission, there's a joy that I have. And as I give this mission now to my brothers and my sisters, my disciples, and as they carry on that mission, there's a joy there. Some of you guys live joyless life. You live your life you're like you're coasting through it. You know why? Because the big part is you probably don't have a mission. You don't have a purpose. You don't have a singular moment. You know, when you go... I'll give you an example. When, when, they, when all these kids went to Arizona, right, they came back, and this year we tripled our numbers of people going to Arizona. And I asked them, like, what did you guys do over there? And what did, do you know what they did over there, right? They stood in the sun. There's no shade, okay? It's dry. They had nosebleed all the time, right? They go out to do mission work, and then they come back. They can't even shower, right, because they're afraid of, like, you know, clogging up the, hep- uh, the septic tank. So they can't shower, right? Middle of the night, they had to stand in this worship room, like, without air conditioning for an hour or two, hearing the pastor preach, right? And what happens when they come back? I can't wait to go again. Why? What did you do out there? You, it was horrible. Yeah, but there was joy. Because why? There was mission. There was a purpose. For those 10 days, they had a singular purpose in their life. And when you have a mission, you guys, you know what you realize comes out of it? There is joy that comes out of it. See, Christians, you guys, we were called into a life of missions. Ultimately, to fulfill God's work and give God glory. But secondarily, we're called into mission because it brings joy to your life. When you have purpose, there is joy. No matter how hard that purpose may be, 
there's joy. But when there is no purpose, when you're coasting, when you're just sitting around, waiting for the best to happen, waiting for thunder and lightning, you know what it is. You feel dry. You feel empty. You're wondering where things are going. You're trying to chase after, if I can get more freedom, maybe I'll be more satisfied. And you chase after it. And you do get satisfied. But you know what happens afterwards? Your joy begins to seep further and further away from you. Doesn't it? Right? When we're When we buy into the idea that my needs is first, we gain our freedom, but we lose our joy. Mission, the result of mission, having a purpose. See, when I say mission, I hope you guys don't think about, I'm telling you guys all to go to like Africa or, or, you know, North Korea and stuff like that. I'm saying mission. The mission of the call of the believers to make disciples. When we have a singular purpose like that, there is joy. There is joy, right? And what greater purpose than the one that Jesus Christ gave him? What greater mission can we possibly have in life than the one that God himself has given? He said that I will redeem everything. All things will be made new in me. I will redeem it all, and I will do it through you. I will use you. Yeah, you can't speak, right? You don't have the abilities, but I will use you for it. And when you... Go off into the mission field. When you go off and you begin to speak truth into people's lives and you see their life transformed, you know what happens? There's joy. There's unbelievable joy. Let me tell you guys this. If you guys have never brought anyone to Christ and see their life grow, right, you'll never understand that joy. To see when when God would use you, you know who you are, as messed up as you are, as broken as you are, as wretched as you are, but God somehow used the words you spoke spoken to someone's heart, transform them, they begin to start seeking and running after God, there is a joy in your soul because you realize, I have lived my life in mission. There is a purpose. Okay? One of the features of mission is this. It's joy. Missions results, I mean, joy results in missions. Okay? The second feature of mission is this. Power of mission is the gospel. Look at verse 14 and 15. Jesus says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. He says, I have given them, my, I have given them your word, your truth, your gospel, and I'm not asking for you to make their life easier. I'm asking you out of love to protect them. Love them by protecting them, right? See, mission is not about sending out missionaries. You guys understand that? Mission is not about sending out missionaries. Mission is about sending the word through missionaries. It's sending the truth of God to missionaries. I'm telling you, people don't need your life out there. They don't need it. You can give out charity. You can go over there. You can speak. You can teach them English. You can give them food. You can give them clothing. It will satisfy them for a moment. That's it. They don't need that. What they need is the truth that you have. You want to change life? You want to change people's lives? Let me ask you this question. Do you know how to speak God's truth? Can you talk about God? Can you hold a conversation for more than five minutes without sounding like a crazy person? Right? Can you articulate the gospel, the very fundamental of our faith? Can you articulate that to people? Can you speak of his death and resurrection and the implications of that? Some of you guys say, well, I don't have fancy words, Tony. I, don't, I can't do that stuff. Right? I don't have the fancy words. You don't need fancy words. What you need is the conviction of the truth of that word in your life. You need the conviction of that truth of that word, and you preach that word. You share that word. You don't have to have all the information, knowledge, and um, the systematic stuff in your head. You need to have the conviction of that truth in your life. You know more truth than you can possibly ever live with, right? But some of you guys don't live that truth. See, when I went to a um, mission one time, um, we, we always had these big teams. And, we, you know, in a, in a big team, you always get, like, lots of different people. And one of the guys was a very young, very egghead, very smart, you know, very intellectual, you know. And when, I really don't like those guys, right? Because when they, I mean, it's actually in terms of um, spirituality. Because they talk 
as if they're very smart in theological words, you know? They, like, having a conversation with them is like trying to, you have to have a, defini- uh, a dictionary when you talk with them, right? Like, what are you saying? Say that again, right? You know, he, he'll be using words like, you know, oh, the propitiation of Jesus Christ and the transubstantiation and the sanctification and the justification. I'm like, no, man, just be quiet, right? I have no idea what you're saying. But he sounds smart, and you think that that's what you need, that's what you need to go into missions. No, that's not what you need, right? And there's other people in the team, they, they kind of like memorize scripts because they, they have no idea anything in their lives. So they just memorize scripts in their head, right? Go up and tell them to share. They'll say stuff like, um, uh, G- Jesus died for you um, on the cross. And um, yeah, we're sinners. Um, what's the next line? <laughs> they'll, 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 they'll say these things because they, they've, they've memorized a script. Right? And you think that it's somehow it's going to save it. No, you guys. People don't need that. They need the conviction of truth in your life. They need to know that what you are giving them is more than just clothing and food and energy. They need to know that what you're giving them is something that they can actually live with, that can actually change their lives, a conviction of that. I had this one kid one time come up. He's like youngest out of the whole team, right? But he's a really good guy. He comes up, and he shared his, he, sh- he just shared the message, you know, because we're, we're all asked to share a message. He came up and he shared. This is what he said. He just spoke with his heart. He spoke with his passion. He said, I've spent my whole life, okay, chasing after a lot of things that I thought would fulfill me sex, money, power. I have given my whole life to worshiping all of these things. And at the point where I'm at now, I realize something very great. That instead of giving me life, what these things have done is they have robbed me of my life. Until the day I heard of the one who made all things. Until the day I heard of the name of Jesus Christ who instead of trying to rob me of the life that I have, he comes down and he gives me his so that I can have a new life. I am broken in a lot of different ways. And yet, there is a God that would die for me. And that's why I'm here. He's changed my life, and I'm here to share that with you. That's what he said, and when he spoke, you can hear the truth of it in his life. You can hear the truth of God's word in his heart. You can know that it's actually transforming his very being. The crowd begins to stay quiet and silent. They hear it as he gives his story and his testimony. Right? The power of the gospel is not you going there and you giving food and clothing and money and giving relief work. All of that is great. All of that is good. It's good to help, right? But that's not the end of it. The power of the gospel is you go there to give them truth, to give them a truth that they can actually live with, that can actually do something for their life. People don't need your life, right? They need the truth that your life is based on. A lot of people say, that's pre- I don't want to do that, Pastor Tony. It's to me, faith is very private, isn't it? To me, my faith is private. I want to keep it to myself. I don't want to have to deal with people. I don't want to have to actually share it. You know, what they believe is what they believe. I want to keep my faith private. I feel like it's arrogant if I go out there and tell them that this is true. It's not arrogance, you guys. Mission is not arrogance. Gospel is not arrogance. It's not arrogant-driven. It's what? It's love-driven. If you had a friend who was sick and you knew a sickness that you had, and you knew how to get them out of it, is it arrogant to tell them? Is it arrogant to actually share with them? No. It's not arrogant to share with them. It's love that you're sharing with them. You see, if you you don't have truth, and all you're trying to do is show them love, you're not going to help them. If you you don't have any truth, and all you're doing is just like, ah, I'm here for you, here's some money, here's some clothing, here's some food, you're not going to help them. If you don't have truth. But if you have truth, but you don't have love behind that to want to share and to want to speak to them, you're not going to help them. The power of the gospel is that there is truth and that there is love. Jesus was saying what? 
I have given them your word, your truth. And my prayer for them is, God, would you protect them as they do this work? Would you protect them, love them as they go out, as the world hates them, but they would do it with love and truth? You see, guys, the power of the gospel, the power of mission comes from the gospel. When you speak, when you, when you talk, right, when you try to share with people, is truth coming out of your lips? Or are you so afraid to share it? Okay? The features of mission, the first thing is this. It's joy. The results of mission is joy. You know that you live powerless life. You know that you live joyless life. You know that you do. And the real reason why you do is not because you haven't made the six figures. The real reason why you're joyless in life is not because you don't have that house or that car. The real reason why your life is walking in a joyless pursuit is because you do not have a singular purpose and mission in your life. You don't. The power of mission is the truth of God's gospel, the gospel truth. That's the power of mission. That's what's going to change people's lives. All right? The last thing, the requirement of mission. Verse 16 and 17. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. The requirement of mission is holiness. It's the word sanctified. Sanctified is this fancy word that means this. You are moving step by step towards Jesus Christ. You are taking a daily walk closer and closer to your God. You're building in yourself holiness. Yeah, you could be taking three steps forward, two steps back, but you're still moving forward. One of the things I always tell the missionaries when we go is this. You cannot turn on holiness like a light switch when you go off to the mission field. You cannot. Do not think that somehow here that you can do whatever you want and then show up on the mission field and then be holy. It does not work that way. You cannot turn on holiness like a light switch. There needs to be a breaking of your spirit. There needs to be a transformation of your mind. There needs to be a renewing of your soul. Every day, taking steps forward, one by one. Some of us may be running forward, and that's great. God has blessed you with that ability. God has blessed you with that movement. Go. Some of us, were trudging along, but we're taking steps day by day, moving towards holiness. Can you guys ever understand this? The real reason probably why some of us are so ineffective in mission is because people do not see holiness in our lives. The real reason why your friends have a hard time accepting the faith that you proclaim is probably because they do not see the holiness in your life. I'm not telling you that you have to be perfect, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that when you have wronged, when you have done something evil, that they see you change from that. They see you move away from that. They see you turn around and walk the opposite way from that. They see a transformation in your life. They see you taking steps forward. They don't see you standing there. They don't see you just coasting. They don't see you just accepting things. They see you moving forward. Big reasons why a lot of our friends do not accept what we believe, right, is because they do not see the holiness in our lives, right? You see, one of the things about, uh, I think I gave this uh, example before, Ben Franklin was not a Christian. Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers, was not a Christian, right? Was not a Christian, but he never denied Christianity. He actually said, I want a church to be in every city in America, right? You know why? Because one of his friends, his name was Pastor George Whitfield. He saw in Pastor George Whitfield holiness. And though Benjamin Franklin never truly bought into Christianity, he said he, he never denied its power. He said, if I could, I would make every single city have a church. Every single city deserves to have a church. This is Benjamin Franklin saying it. And he gave so much of his finances to George Whitfield's orphanage and his work. Because why? He saw in his friend's life holiness. He saw in his friend's life transformation. 
a lot of us, you guys, are so ineffective as Christians, right? Because they fail to see holiness in your life. Again, I'm not saying that they always have to see this front that you put up. You're allowed to be dumb, okay? You're allowed to have mistakes. You're allowed to do wrong things. But what they see is they see you moving forward from that. They see you picking yourself up, realizing what's wrong, repenting of it, and moving forward. Right? They see you changing. And when they see that, they, they, they begin to think, what would drive this brother? What would drive this sister to do such a thing? It must be their God. It must be their God. See, people think that if you just bring friends to church, right, get some preaching, it will change them. No, you know what's going to change them? The truth and the holiness of your life. Right? Holiness of your life. People aren't interested in the preaching. People want to know if you actually live what you preach and what you believe. Okay? So whether you're going off, you guys, whether you are going off to the mission field overseas or whether you're staying here at home, you are called into missions with equal intensity, equal passion. You're called into it with equal passion. Whether you're the one holding the ropes or whether you're the one on the rope going into the well, you are there with equal passion. Are there scars on your hand to show that, church? You cannot make the excuse forever, my church is the one that's go- is doing great things for missions. That's awesome. What are you doing for missions? When God speaks to you on the day of judgment, he says, you tell him, my, God, my church has done great things for the people over it. But what have you done? Where are the scars on your hand? What have it cost you? The life of a follower of Jesus Christ is a life of mission. Some of you guys, you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know if I can actually do it. I don't know if I can actually engage in that. You see, until you actually put the step forward, until you actually bite the bullet and say, I am going, I am going to make this happen. I am going to give my heart to the singular pursuit. You will never see the joy that comes out of it. You know you won't. You can't. You can't just sit there and, and say, oh, I've done that before. Nothing worked. Whenever someone tells me I've done that before, nothing worked, you know what they tell me? You know what that really means? Right? I did it for a day. Right? And it didn't work. Obviously, it's not going to work. Right? It's like saying, you know, I can't build muscles because I worked out for one day. Not working. I'm not meant to work out anymore. Right? Forget it. Right? I'm just made this way. God has just made me fat. Right? Just got to deal with it. Of course not. When you give your heart to a singular pursuit of missions. What you see in it is a life of joy. You will know what joy is. You stop chasing after freedom because freedom ends up robbing you of your joy. You actually live a life of missions. Right? When you speak, you speak the gospel truth, the conviction of it, that you know what's been done in your life, and then you live your life in holiness. Holiness before God, before men. When they see that, when they see that, you become effective in missions. Okay? The call of missions, you guys, we're all called to go, right? The features of missions is that joy is the, re- is the result of it. The gospel is the power of it, right? And holiness is the requirement of it. And Jesus says, I have come. I have sanctified myself so that they too can be sanctified. You know what Jesus is saying? I have walked that walk too so that now they can do it as well. We are not doing this alone. We're following after the footsteps of our Lord. He has walked it first. It cost him his life. It may cost you your life, right? But I promise you, all the disciples, and if you ever read the book of Acts, all the disciples, no matter how badly they were beaten, no matter how much they have or do not have, one thing they always said is this, I rejoice in the suffering of Christ. I rejoice in the fact that I can suffer for Christ. I have joy because why? I have mission. I have a purpose. And I'm carrying it out. Let's pray.
We're going to spend some time in response with um, offering, with uh, communion. As you come up, and if you are a, a member of TLC, or if you're a believer in Christ, you come up and you take this communion. As you take of the bread, would you remember that this body was broken so that life can be given? As you drink of the juice, would you remember that this is the blood that was spilled so that you can have a new promise in life? That he has restored all of that to the body and to his blood. That now you are called into the mission. You are called for your body to be broken and even for your blood to be spilled. Figuratively or actually. You're called into that. And as we eat of that, would we remember the mission that God has given to us? As we eat of, as we take part in this communion, we remember that this is what God has given to us. So let's bow our heads and we pray for you guys. And when you're ready to come up, um, take up the communion, take up the bread, take up the juice, and as a response to Him, as you take of it, says, I will go on mission, oh God. I will live this life. Help me to remember that this life is about the mission that you have given to me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father God, because you have given your Son, my Lord, Jesus Christ, the mission. To come down and to live, to teach, to preach. To have his body broken, to live a life of holiness. And that all those who saw and all those who heard were convicted and transformed. A life of God that brought joy that we can see. I thank you so much, Lord God, for that mission. Today, as we partake at your table, help us to remember that broken body and that blood that was spilled. Help us to remember that we are too called to mission, that we are too called to fulfill the mission that you have given to us, that purpose. As we take of the body, as we drink of the blood, remind us, oh God, our body, our blood as well. We thank you, oh God, that we have purpose in you. We thank you, God, that we stop chasing after our freedom because we know that it robs us of our We thank you so much that we have the ability in our heart to find joy and purpose in you. So, Lord, we surrender this time to you as we respond to you, God, we just be honored and blessed. And Father, we you begin to Fill us with your spirit. May you begin, Father, to speak your truth into our hearts, break down the walls that we have placed up. And Father, we begin to trust in you. And you have a plan, and you will see it to completion no matter what. Lord, I pray that we would be used 